for a very long time when I was, uh, you know, kind of going through the, I want to become this when I grow up. Um, every time I got asked the question, it was always architect. I want to become an architect. I grew up in a developing country. Um, and the reason I wanted to become an architect was because I wanted to be able to design huge, huge, massive homes for all of my family, for my mom, my sister, my uncle, my auntie, everybody. Um, and I remember just before I started my A-levels, mom came into my room and said, why don't you consider engineering? Um, and one of the first things that came to my mind was, why do I want to repair cars? You know, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what she was trying to get at. I, I, yeah, she drove a 1980 uh, Passat, but, but seriously, she could go to the mechanic to get her car fixed. Um, but then I considered it, and she, she talked me through all the amazing uh, possibilities that engineering held. And, I, and I, I wasn't very sure, but you know, I did it for mom, um, and absolutely have no regrets now. Um, engineering has been uh, a question of context for me, solving our world's problems. Um, issues that are similar throughout the world um, in different continents, consistent um, across the different spheres of life. Um, I've done a couple of checks and I keep on asking people, what would you regard as, what do you think of developing countries? And when you type it into Google and ask Google what Google thinks, um, it comes up with suggestions like a country having a standard of living or level of industrial production well below that possible with financial or technical aid. Um, you know, some say, uh, you know, a country with little industrial and economic activity, all sorts, poor country. But the thing that I've realized is that is shifting. Countries that were poor, you know, 20, 30 years ago are slowly moving into the, you know, between the poor and the rich, nearly becoming rich countries. But the issues are there. The issues that we will deal with in this country, like flooding, for example, uh, the effects of climate change, countries that would be you know, regarded as developing are experiencing this, these issues also. Um, the current state of affairs is a very, very interesting one in a way. In the 1800s, there was one billion people on this planet and things were probably a bit more manageable then. Uh, 1900s, that number doubled, two billion, right? Uh, 2000, something happened in 100 years, we went from two billion to seven billion. Incredible. Um, now the projections uh, for the next couple of uh, years, well, till for, for 2000 and 100, uh, Africa, for example, numbers are expected to jump from 810 million people that we currently kind of counted in 2000 uh, to 3.5 billion people. In Asia, the number is expected to also go from 3.7 to 4.6 billion. Europe, we're expecting a decline. Um, in South America, we're expecting an increase from 521 million people to potentially 700 million people, right? And it's the same, North America the same. There's gonna be that jump of numbers. Uh, the Oceanas, jump of numbers. Now in the 50s, you know, you could sort of count the mega cities of the world. You know, you could kind of go, okay, the ones that are, you know, between 10 million and 25 million in terms of population numbers. Um, you, New York, Tokyo. You know, those were the two countries that you were right at the tip of, uh, right at the top of that uh, list. Uh, by 2014, a lot more cities of our world, a lot more cities of our world featured in that list. You know, with African cities, with cities in India, uh, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, in addition to, you know, obviously Tokyo and New York. Now, 2025, we're looking at an even bigger number. And the question is, how are we going to deal, how are we going to provide the infrastructure for all these growing cities? People are moving around, people are being born in one country and end up living in another country. And that is where the role of an engineer, 
That is where the work that I've been doing over the last, you know, eight, nine years is relevant to everyday lives. Here in China, in Africa, uh, in, in the US. Now, um, I lived in China for a couple of years, in Shanghai. Um, I moved with a British company um, out to China. And I remember when I first told my family I was moving to China and everybody went, why, what did you do at work? Is this a punishment? What, what have you done? Um, now, that is because the role of, a, of the engineer is becoming extremely transferable. You know, you qualify here in this country and the issues and the solutions you're able to deliver in this country are applicable to pretty much any parts of the world. Now, in, over the next 12 years, it's expected that 250 million rural residents would move into newly constructed cities in China. Now, the question is, what does that result in? Now, that's an example of what that could potentially result in. You need to move people in trains, you know, in cars, in planes. All of that is hinged on the ideas that would come from engineering principles. Now, buildings require incredible amounts of resources. You're thinking about the steel, you're thinking about the concrete, you're thinking about you know, the fact that buildings consume so much energy, heating, cooling, etc. Now, this is also some of it in terms of the consequence. People have to then build cities with huge numbers of skyscraper type buildings, um, really just preparing for the people that are going to come into those cities. Now, in other parts of the world, this is the consequence. Slums, disorganized settlements, places that people really only have that, you know, uh, corrugated iron sheet shelter over their heads. And again, it's in the work that people do, it's in the engineering work, in the planning of spaces, in the use of new materials, in 3D printing of homes, that one would be able to provide living, comfortable, excuse me, comfortable living spaces for people. Um, I'll just skip that quickly. Now, 90% of our time is spent in buildings. We wake up in the morning, we're in a building. We go to school, college, we're in a building. Um, we come to events like this, we're in a building. Um, buildings are literally living machines. Um, we need the, the heating on, we need the lights on. Um, and the work that I've done over the years has been largely based on making sure our buildings are more efficient. Um, we're using so much energy these days, and the question always is, how can we use our natural resources? You know, how can we use sunlight better? How can we use the rainfall that falls on our roofs uh, better? Um, the rainwater better to be able to flush our toilets um, or, or, or water our gardens. Um, now, this is a picture um, of Shanghai uh, in 2013. Um, and that's a picture of Shanghai in, in, in the 80s, I think, in the early 1980s. Um, and you can see the huge, massive difference literally the huge massive difference in a couple of years and that is what we expect to see in our world's big cities now it be an engineer's job to be able to design the infrastructure the high-rise buildings the fact that you can have breakfast you know on the 92nd floor of that building and trust the elevators to work um, <laughs> uh, the fact that you can you know you, you've got an office building in there but then it's not just about that how do we protect these cities too? So some of the work that I've you know, done, the same as you'd have here in this country, is protecting you know, large cities, growing cities from disasters, from flooding, um, how you build, you know, this is again, pick, these are pictures from my time in, 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 uh, in China. You know, with all of that in infrastructure going up, 
again, there were things that needed to be sorted out, like making sure water drained correctly. Um, with all the buildings around, water obviously needs uh, a passage for it to kind of, you know, get away from where people are. Um, so an engineer's job, again, part of the work that I did was to make sure that cities like this had floodgates. We could control the flow of water in and out of the cities. Now, another really exciting aspect is also the fact that, you know, we spend a lot of time in buildings. Buildings consume so much energy. Um, greening our environment is a big, massive thing. The fact that we want to breathe healthy air, the fact that we want to be able to produce food in our living spaces. With all of our buildings going up, um, we're, we're, we're removing the potential uh, for, for growth of food. Um, and the exciting thing about the form that architecture and engineering is taking now is that it's bringing, it's bringing agriculture back into our living spaces where people can grow tomatoes, they can grow vegetables in their living spaces. And it's not just the question of, oh, it looks nice because it's got a green roof. It's about the integration of the plants and the types of plants that can survive uh, in people's living spaces. Um, now, development. It's, you know, there's, people think of development as just one solution. But development is, I, in my view, you know, coming up with appropriate technologies for each of our world's different continents. Um, I'm using Africa as an example now because it's, it's, it's full of opportunities because there isn't one standard way of doing things at the moment. Um, challenges equal great opportunity. Uh, solar thermal systems an opportunity for companies to come up with and for people to design solar thermal systems uh, or PVs, photovoltaics, um, that people in different communities can use as packages is also one exciting aspect of the work that uh, the engineer, the development engineer does. Um, water supply. When I first of all started, I spent some time in Mozambique really understanding you know, why people had to walk long distances to be able to collect water. And when they actually got to these places, how were they sure that the water quality was good? Um, and that is ongoing work. But the fun thing is that there's a beautiful relationship between coming up with the engineering and coming up with sustaining the engineering in these spaces. So there's, an, so there's a social aspect to it too. You need to understand how people live, uh, what time they wake up to go collect water, how long the water is standing for in their homes, what they use the water for. Um, so it's the engineering that helps you deliver the service, but then the social engineering, in my view, helps you keep that service going for these people and improves their lives. Um, sanitation, also a massive, massive opportunity for some really good work. Again, this was, the top pictures were uh, from Ghana, the bottom picture was from Mozambique, and a business was developed around uh, ensuring that people's pit latrines were, you know, to some standard of cleanliness. Again, that business model, so not just the engineering, which is this pump here, but there was the social aspect of it, the buildings, as the business aspect of it, the economics aspect of it, so tied quite nicely. So the role of the development or design engineer is not just about the science, but also about really understanding the people um, and the business uh, potential behind it. Um, again, you know, rainwater harvesting opportunities everywhere in our schools. And um, one of my fun projects here in the UK was developing a rainwater harvesting solution for the kids in the school. And they could actually see the water coming in through into like, you know, big massive tank with viewing turrets. And, and I was this close to putting some yellow rubber ducks in it so they could see how. Um... Now, uh, I'm gonna finish off with the role technology plays. It's extremely exciting, it's right at the heart of it. Farmers can get their products to market because of technology now. 
You know, somebody can send a message to somebody and say, oh, I've got, you know, five, 10 tubers of yam. Uh, you're picking up from X farm, pick up from Y farm and deliver it to the market, you know, within 10, 12 hours. Now, this is completely changing the terrain. It's completely changing. People who program are finding solutions to, you know, problems that have been around forever, where farmers can't get their products to market, um, you know, health and well-being. People are able to send messages to the hospitals, uh, you know, the built environment. So there's an ability to monitor lifestyle, ability to monitor, you know, floods, potentially problem areas. Um, and online platforms too. Online platforms are actually creating opportunities for people to sell the products that they have and completely transforming uh, the way that people do things. I'll end with a, a beautiful, beautiful testimony to the role that technology plays. Now, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sesnam Dagadu, he's based in Ghana, has come up with an app. Um, and what this app does is it generates postcodes for the people that live in Accra. So if you've uh, lived in a developed world, like myself, if you lived in either Ghana or Nigeria, you know, when somebody wants to come visit you, you don't really give them an address, you know? You give them a landmark figure. It's like, oh yeah, this is a hospital in the corner. And when you get to the hospital, right, you ask the guy that's in front of the hospital where the next turning on the right is. And when you get to that next gate on the right, right, you just carry on walking until you find a woman that sells food at the side of the road. She knows where my house is, <laughs> right? Um, but with, with snow code, you know, you generate um, a postcode, it's an app. The emergency services have that code also. You can send it to them. And with GPS systems, I don't think you even have to be online. They can find you. Um, and that's the beauty of the applicability of engineering. You know, basic principles, technological principles, coding principles, applying, apply to different people in different places, solving very, very different issues and improving people's lives. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.